Good afternoon. There was almost a call and response as we turned to the panel on religion. Uh, uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon. All right. Um, so my name is Joseph Surrett, member of the faculty here at Colombian Religion and African American Studies. It's my privilege and pleasure to uh, moderate this panel uh, with two individuals who I've known actually for quite some time. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome them here and thank you all for sticking around for the next set of conversations. I'm looking now for our panel. Where is our panel in the program? Here, here we are. Religion, race, politics in the inner city. As you've already noticed from the program, we are a little short than expected. Our thoughts are with Professor Michael Leo Owens and Monica Miller, both of whom had different circumstances intervene at the last minute uh, and, and to prevent them from joining us today. Um, and so our thoughts are with both of them. Uh, in many ways, we can think of something as uh, something along the likes of improvisation as always being occasioned by precarity and scarcity. We're not quite in those conditions in this site of privilege, but uh, we know that we have quality in our two panelists, if not the same quantity. And so I will very quickly uh, introduce our panelists, uh, say a couple of short things about how we might think about religion in the wire and then turn it over uh, to them to lead us into conversation, hopefully leaving a significant amount of time for conversation with you all in uh, the auditorium today. So I sent them just a very brief encouragement in terms of how we might uh, think about our conversation today with the hopes that we might move from a broader discussion of religion, race, and politics in the inner city, as the panel has been named, to thinking more specifically about how The Wire invites us to think about how religion and race converge and diverge, emerge in cities around the country at this moment, but also how these issues are represented on the screen in the several series of The Wire. Some might suggest that the, trope, the show could stand in uh, as a support for the notion of the city as the site of sin and vice, or the site of religion's absence, or the site where God is dead and gone, but we know that as followers of The Wire that there is so much more to the story of the show, uh, whether it's the multiple ways in which preachers like Frank Madison Reed show up as himself or uh, played by someone else. Uh, here I'm thinking of the third generation AME pastor who pastors Bethel AME in Baltimore. We can think of Cuddy's relationship to the deacon, played by Melvin Williams, uh, who was also the inspiration, as I understand it, for Avon Barksdale. Uh, which opens questions of re-entry as the deacon advises Cuddy as he opens up the boxing gym. Or right, the relationship between the more formidable stories around the streets, the jails, the trade, the docks, life off the books, if you will, as they converge with something called religion in that episode where Omar shows up to escort his grandmother to church and streets blur over into that religious space. The social worlds of the church and the streets are not, in fact, unrelated, mutually exclusive, even in the story uh, that are told on the wire. So I'm excited to have uh, Joseph Winters, Professor Joseph Winters, and Reverend Lakeisha Walren to help us think about the ways in which religion, race, and politics are at play. So first I will introduce Joseph, uh, Professor Winters, who is an assistant professor of religious studies at Duke University where he teaches courses and conducts research in religion and critical theory, African-American religious thought and continental philosophy. He received his BA from Harvard, his MTS from Duke, and his PhD from Princeton in religion, ethics, and politics. His forthcoming book next month, we are yeah. greatly, uh, <laughs> greatly anticipated. Not as much as Joe is excited about that. Uh, Hope Draped in Black. Race, Melancholy, Melancholy and the Agony of Progress, wherein he uses the idea of melancholy as expressed in black literature and religion to challenge racial progress narratives and post-racial fantasies. He's also uh, part of a group of uh, scholars in the field of religious studies, along with Monica Miller, who are really putting hip hop at the front and center of the field. Uh, and so I'm excited to hear his thoughts today. Uh, Professor Winters will be followed by the Reverend Lakeisha Walren, uh, Reverend Walrand is a native of Texas uh, who went on to earn degrees from Spelman College in psychology and education, three separate degrees from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a master's in education, uh, well, two masters in education, one in school administration and the other in special education, along with a PhD 
uh, in special education and literacy from UNC Chapel Hill. She's both a practitioner and a theorist. More recently, she went back and received the MDiv across the street here at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, Reverend Walren worked both in the schools, again, a key site in the wire, uh, in teaching and in administrative positions in North Carolina, uh, as well as in uh, associate minister capacity, minister capacity at Zion Temple Church in North Carolina for eight years. Where she was both active in schools, church, and community in the greater Durham area. She currently serves as executive director, or executive pastor, excuse me, uh, First Corinthians Baptist Church, alongside working alongside her husband, Reverend Michael A. Walren, who's senior pastor there. In this capacity, she plays a key role in leading the administrative aspects of the ministry, which now serves an active membership of at least two or three thousand, but a greater body of ten thousand. It is the church that is no longer on the rise in Harlem, but has <laughs> been, <laughs> it is uh, the place to be, and they're doing amazing work through the sanctuary, but also through their dream center in helping to support the changing landscape of Harlem and beyond. So we will hear first from Professor Winters, followed by Reverend Dr. Walden. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yosef. Um, very glad. I want to thank the organizers. Um, I want to thank Yosef for recommending my name. I'm sure that's one reason why people really knew who I was, but no, seriously, I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank the, the panelists. And the other panels, right, um, the last couple of days have been really fascinating. I've learned a lot about a show that I've probably watched too many times, each, each, each episode, each series. But um, every time I go back to the show, um, I feel like I watch, it, I watch it for the first time to some extent. Um, so let me just say a little bit about how I, came, um, I kind of came to the show, just real quick. When I was writing my dissertation um, in 2008, my dissertation was looking at the relationship between mourning and hope in a critical theory in African American religious and literary thought. So I was looking at a lot of Toni Morrison, W.B. Du Bois, Ralph Ellison, and so forth. Um, and I started watching the show. Um, I started watching the show uh, with one of my uh, roommates. And he said, you know, the show actually is kind of like, I mean, it's, it's articulating and visualizing your dissertation to some extent, right? The relationship between the tragic and, and I mean, not intention or anything, right? But there's a way in which it's kind of visualizing this complicated relationship between the tragic and hope, uh, mourning and hope. Also, just say, uh, summer of 2013, um, after the uh, the acquittal of George Zimmerman, I remember I was finishing up I was finishing up my book, or the, the, one one of the versions of the book, right? And I remember um, I just had this, this kind of emptiness, right? Um, and it was for, for about a week I couldn't write, I couldn't write. Um, fortunately, I guess this is one of the advantages of being a professor is that I, I, I could take a little time off because it was during the summer. But I just rewatched the life, right? And I realized it wasn't like I felt better after watching the life. Right? It wasn't like it wasn't, it's not, it wasn't that. But for some reason, the, the kinds of affects and emotions I was feeling, right, it made sense for me to kind of watch. So I guess I'm saying that because I guess for me it was a, it's, it's a kind of spiritual practice. Like almost every summer I go back to it. I read it differently, right? I have more, I have a lot of critiques of it now, right? Watching it over and over. But so I just wanted to kind of start with that. Um, it's kind of personal note. So let me start. There, there are at least there are many critiques that I hear uh, of the wire. One, which I'm not going to talk about here, we, we certainly should be talking about, is the why of gender politics, right? right? At times, right? At times, it seems progressive. At times, it seems very problematic, right? The other two, um, the other two that I hear, right, um, especially recently from a colleague was, there doesn't seem to be a character who's redeemable in the show, right? That, right, all, he says something like, all the characters are corruptible, right? There doesn't seem to be any hope, right, or redemption in the wire, right? One of the panelists yesterday said, it's so depressing, Right? Um, another, which I think is actually related, uh, another critique I hear is there doesn't seem to be a place for the black church, right? or tradition of black right? institutions. Um, black institutions in the wire right, seem to be in the background. Right? They seem to just be right, the backdrop. Right? They don't seem to be primary agents or influences in the, in the narratives and characters in the series. Right? Um, James Costin, in his, um, uh, the prologue to the book Corners of the City of God, makes this, makes this, makes this argument. He suggests that right that the church is just in the background, right? And it never comes right, it's never a kind of right sort of character in, in the series, right? So I want to kind of juxtapose and perhaps connect and push back against these two concerns and trajectories of thought. Part of my argument is that the wire exists somewhere between tragedy and redemption, right? Or the tragic, right, and the hopeful. More specifically, I suggest that part of the show's appeal is that it refuses to divorce the two. Right? 
the possibility of a better world in Baltimore and other American, cities, other American cities is linked to and enabled by a recalcitrant sense of the tragedy, of the ability to remember, register, and keep alive the painful details and recurring damages of the fort and limit our best efforts to change things. I end by suggesting that, the tragic, that this tragic vision shapes the wire's portrayal of public religion, black churches, etc. A general conversation right, is emerging about the relationship between realism, tragedy, and utopia in The Wire. According to Frederick Jameson, The Wire surpasses most television series because of its ability to hold in tension realism and utopia. What I take Jameson to be saying is that the show forces us to confront certain kinds of inveterate right, conditions, bureaucratic structures, economic disparity, right, the static recalcitrant quality of institutions, both legal and illegal, at the same time, Jameson sees moments where the possibility of something new right, and different interrupts the repetitive cycles of urban life. Here he is thinking of Frank Zabatka right, attempting to revitalize the port and save right, the labor union, or Roland Kesbalewski using innovative methods to teach math to his right, to high students, right, to like, throwing dice and so forth, or Stringer Bell and Pop Joe trying to create a co-op of drug dealers that share instead of violently compete over territory and, uh, and product. These utopian moments are what he calls cracks or slits into the seamless necessity of the wire, that's his term. These are, of course, moments that always run up against the very limits that they moment momentarily transcend. While Jameson contrasts the wire's utopian realism with melodrama, Linda Williams' book On the Wire argues that the show is a unique and exceptional form of melodrama. Right? She talked about this yesterday in her uh, in the, in the panel yesterday. Um, <clears throat> Williams contends against David Simon's assertion that the wire is more of a melodrama than, than, than a tragedy. What exactly is the relationship between the two? According to Williams, both, drama, both genres accent suffering, pain, and loss, and injustice, and both evoke compassion for those characters that experience injustice. Yet while tragedy, exemplified by Greek plays like Oedipus or Antigone, is an acceptance of fate, even, even as it seems terrible to endure, melodrama quote, always offers a contrast between how things are and how they could be or should be. There's some disparity right, between how things are and possibility. Melodrama, unlike tragedy, offers hope that things could be different, so while we might acknowledge that characters like D'Angelo and Wallace are pawns in a chess game that they did not choose, Williams contends that their deaths are not tragic in the classical sense. For her, only Frank Sabak and Stringer Bell fulfill the criteria for tragic death. We can talk more about that. The show's narrative, in other words, does not suggest that D'Angelo and Wallace accept their fates, or that the audience should accept the social conditions and predicaments that lead to their untimely deaths. Things could be otherwise. At the same time, The Wire is a superior form of melodrama, according to uh, Williams, because it does not locate hope in some heroic individual or rescue narrative. As we see in the case of quasi-redemptive quasi characters like Naaman and Bubbles, if there is to be hope for justice, this is her quote, as there must be in melodrama, it, it is from an alignment of many complex personal and institutional pieces. And even though many of the other characters' hopes are frustrated or thwarted, the wire encourages us to imagine what a better world and social arrangement might look like. For Williams, dissent, resistance to fate, imagining possibility and utopia belong more to melodrama and they do to, to tragedy. Jameson and Williams encourage us to think about the relationship in the series between representations of suffering and violence and the promise of something better, right, between the inertia of social arrangements and the possibility of rupture, change, and transformation. Parting ways just a bit from Williams, I underscore, I want to underscore the tragic dimensions, right, even traditionally tragic dimensions of the wire, the sense of fadedness and repetition within the social order, um, which I think are exem exemplified in the final montage of season five. So for many, those who have seen The Wire, there's a moment in that final montage of season five where Bubs, or Bubbles, try, you know, like, ascends the stairs, right? right? Uh, ascends the basement stairs into his sister's kitchen. For those who know the right, who haven't seen it, right? right? As a drug addict, his sister, right, allows him to stay in the house, right? But only in the basement. The suggestion is, is that she'd been trying to help him, right, numerous times, but he had manipulated her in the past, right? Um, so to see, to see him actually ascend the stairs, there's a moment of triumph, right? There's a moment, right, there's a moment of joy even, sense of pleasure, we've seen, right, we've seen uh, Bubbles, right, uh, encounter all kinds of obstacles, right, we've seen him have to experience the death of Johnny, Sherrod, right, he was the target of violence in season four, right, uh, another member of the streets, right. Two shots before that, though, we see Duquan, right, shooting, right, heroin, presumably heroin into his veins, right. And the scene right before that, we see Michael sticking up, right, um, almost, right, almost like he's becoming Omar to some extent. Uh, Sidner is talking to Judge Phelan, almost repeating Jimmy McNulty's relationship to the judge in season one. Lester Freeman is working on right, Dahl's miniatures, right? Um, 
Shardim, who just kind of mysteriously kind of comes back up in season season five. We can talk about that, right? Um, but he's right. Uh, Rhonda and Daniels, right? We see them in court, right? So there's, there's been a kind of movement there. Fat-faced Rick and Slim are talking to the Greeks as they're replacing Marlowe and Procho. So these characters have moved to some extent, but within the same system, right, and arrangement, right? Here I take it, right, that this, this is complicated, right? So on one hand, we're seeing change, but we're also seeing this repetitiveness, right, this repetition, right? Slavoj Zizek actually said, he compares it to the Lion King cycle of life, right? The cycle, what is it, uh, is it cycle of, yeah. Circle of life. Circle of life, circle of life right? <laughs> Right, he kind of, right, but he sees something important in there, but, he, right, but he's um, suggesting that there is a kind of repetitive nature that you might associate with fadedness and the tragic. He always taken that Simon is not only resisting any simple <coughs> conciliatory ending, but he is juxtaposing images of hope and possibility with images that remind us of how entrenched the characters and we ourselves are in certain conditions and arrangements that the wire trial draws our attention to. Perhaps the show is arguing that justice or something like liberation in people's lives will require a radical transformation of the social order. Perhaps the show is suggesting that with change and forward movement, there will always be forms of conflict, suffering, exclusion, unequal power relationships, etc. The trace of the tragic will always be witnessed. So how does this tension between tragedy and hope inform the show's depiction of religion, the black church, the churches more generally? How does the show unwittingly participate in contemporary discourses in religious studies about the quote-unquote death and afterlife of the black church? This is my colleague, my colleague and mentor, Eddie Law, a few years back, right, has, uh, has an article um, called you know the death of the black church right which in many ways right in many ways the uh, you know he, he admitted he was trying to be provocative he was trying to unsettle right I think he also actually responded right in religious distance but basically he was just suggesting right he was trying to complicate how we understand the black church but he used the language of death I guess to be a kind of provocateur and it did provoke a lot of people definitely um, so there's a concern as I pointed out earlier on about the lack of religion in the way right so questions of where is the church except for in the background or accept on right the day before the, the, the elections, right? Um, where is the, the broader community outside of drug dealers, addicts, corner boys, etc.? Right? And this is interesting, right? Because often when I hear people criticizing, right, lack of, of a black church presence is often connected to where's the broader community, right? In the wire, there is this kind of nostalgia, right? So when Monk is talking to um, Omar, he says, You remember how it was back in the day, because they went to the same high school, right? He says, you know, we had some bad boys for real, right? But right, the people were kind of together in a certain type of way. And some of those community meetings. There's a sense in which things were better, right? Even um, even around right policing in neighborhoods, right? Right when um, McNulty in season four, right? He said he had a sense that as a B cop, he had more of an intimate relationship, right? And there's a sense that right things in the past were a little bit different, right? There's a more intimate relationship between um, between the neighborhood and cops and so forth, right? So that's just something to think about. The kind of there's a kind of nostalgia which I think is connected to melodrama, as other ones would point out, right? I so I think so. But as, as, as he also pointed out, right, you do have these moments, right? So you have moments where, right, Melvin Williams' character, the deacon, right, and his relationship to Cuddy, right, there's a moment, right, so um, obviously he helps, right, Cuddy, right, he helps Cuddy to, to open up the gym. But in addition, right, there's another minister who also helps, right, who also helps him out because he has political connections, right? What's interesting is uh, one Sunday morning he comes to the gym and he says, how come you always know what everybody's doing? Like, well, a good church man should be in everybody's itch, right, I'll say it, right? But the idea, you no, know, the idea here, right, I, won't, I mean, I'm, right, but the idea here is, as Joseph was saying, there's a complicated connection here between sacred and profane, right? That, right, that the, the, the deacon, even if Cuddy refuses, right, the, right, the, the church in a certain type of way, there's a way in which the, right, the church in a certain kind of, right, a certain kind of outreach and sense of social justice is, right, is shaping, right, Cuddy and informing Cuddy in a certain type of way, or enabling Cuddy's re-entry, as, as you pointed out, right? Um, then, of course, right, um, he's also the conscience for Buddy Colvin in a certain type of way, right? When he walks through Amsterdam, and he comes back, what did you do here, right? So I think there's, there's a way in which, I mean, I think that's important. Even if we don't always, we only see him in church a couple times, I think it's important, right, that that's informing, right, his relationship to other people in the, in the, in the wire. This poses re rehabilitation, right? This rehabilitation takes place in a church, right? There's a moment where he's talking to Wayland in the background, I think it's St. James Church, right? You see, where you see an image of that. I think it's just important to remember, right, even if the wire doesn't, 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 doesn't accent this, right, it does at least, right, remind us and point to, right, this long legacy of church programs helping addicts, right? On the flip side, right, there's another side here, right? We know that there's a moment where we see a minister, right, laundering money, right, for, for, for Prop Joe and Marlo, right? There's a right, the ministers themselves seem to be this very powerful, right, political block or institution in Baltimore. There's always, they have the support of the ministers, right? Are they being endorsed by the ministers? The ministers will be okay if they fire, you know, uh, um, um, Burrell or something like that, right? So they're, they're very much like involved politically, right? In Baltimore, right? Right. So what I want to suggest, so instead of, I mean, I think that, I, I do think that there's a way in which, right, um, there's a way in which the black church is absent, right? 
But another way to read it would be something like this, right? That Simon places, right? Simon places the black church in the mess, right? I mean, the messiness of Baltimore, right? Or what Cornel West might call the funk of social life, right? The church is not placed outside this predicament, right? In a privileged, sanitized position to rescue and save Baltimore, which does not mean for me that the church is not involved in helping people better their lives, right? So within black church, I'll, then I'll, I'll be quiet. I'll, I'll, okay. You're good, you're good. Okay, I'll just, just say within black, um, I can go on about this room, right? So I'll just, I'll, I'll, this is my last point, right? Black, within black religious studies, um, there's been some interesting, right, uh, developments, right? Um, one is to kind of not, not dismiss, but at least trouble what some have called the black church narrative, right? What do I mean by that, right? Um, or decenter the black church narrative, right? So one is the idea, right, that black people are naturally religious, right? right? This idea that if you're, if you're black, you're kind of, it's in your bones in a certain type of way, right? Some people have contested that idea. Others have, have been critical of the ways in which right, black religion is reduced to black Protestantism. Right? So what happens to black Catholics, right? Muslims, right? Uh, black Hebrews, those who practice Voodoo, and to rewrite. So there's a way in which, right, the point is not dismissing. They understand it's a power in there for a reason, but to decenter it in trouble in a certain type of way. Right? Then there's something like Barbara Savage who wants to suggest right, that, um, not, you know, she's not calling the death of the black church, but she wants to contest this idea that the black church has a unified theology. Right? When we talk about the, the black church, right, the assumption is often that it's a coherent institution over time. But there's levels of coherence, but also incoherence. Right? There's conflict, conflicting ideologies, conflicting conceptions of politics. But what Barbara Savage wants to suggest is right, it's problematic when we assume that there's a unified, um, unified theology in the black church, and that that theology is necessarily liberative and subversive. Right? She wants to suggest that right, you know, there's conservative dimensions, there's liberative dimensions, and often that picture of black church is liberative right, is because of a certain moment, right, Black freedom struggles in the 60s, right, are being right, privileged over other moments, right? So, you know, she also points out that there have been healthy debates, right, in and outside of the academy about whether the black church is actually good for black people, right? Right. Now, that's not the point here is that it's bad for black. The point is, is that right, that, has, that potentially has ambivalent effects, right? Especially, I think, for Barbara Savage when we're talking about gender, sexuality, and so forth, right? Um, so, what I want to take it is, is that in a wire, right? I mean, even if right, the black church is not right, kind of front center, even if it seems to be that marginalized, right, there's an, implicit, there's an implicit acknowledgement that black religion is messy, complicated, complicit with other institutions, even as it provides practices and programs that enable people to navigate their environment in more healthy ways. Thank you. Can I get the screen off? Good afternoon. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, to be a part of this conversation. And so um, I'd like to thank Yosef and all of those who organized um, this conference. Um, I want to just talk a little bit um, more about the kind of practical side of um, the impact of uh, the wire and, and religion, and particularly um, countering the negative narrative, which in um, kind of my overview of, of watching the, the, the Wire, uh, most of the images that I see um, involving the black church, in my opinion, were, were, were particularly negative. Um, and so I, I want to just be transparent and say that um, I have not watched this as many times as Joseph or yeah. Yosef, or, yeah. or certainly many of you who are in the audience who are probably, probably um, experts on the wire. Um, I actually kind of did a crash course um, over the past couple of weeks uh, watching. It's interesting because my husband loved this show um, and we were both invited to be on the panel but he was traveling uh, so he kind of laughed at me and said haha you're finally gonna have to watch this show. Um, and so I'm really just just want to say um, were the images that we've seen um, in the wire significant? So I kind of significant or not? Nah, something that my daughter uh, who's 21 says all the time. Nah, nah, not really. Um, because what we've really seen are a bunch of kind of scattered uh, images, uh, whether it's the priest who's kind of um, almost selling stained glass windows in, in season two, or um, the, the pastor who is um, laundering money um, and cleaning money in, in season four, or the pastor who we just get one brief sermon, um, and in that sermon uh, uh, is really talking about um, political activism. But certainly, um, all of those images and every single scene 
um, are, are tertiary scenes. They're not primary, they're not secondary. Um, this is not um, Simon's goal to make religion kind of the forefront um, of, of this series. Um, but what I find is there's this kind of co-opting of religious imaging um, where we're really not even seeing a balance of uh, the wonderful things that the churches are doing or that any church is doing, but what we're seeing is how the church plays a part in the corruption that's happening um, on the streets of Baltimore. So I wanted to really bring in, I have uh, three scenes that I kind of want to play and talk a little bit about to, to help kind of move us further in this um, in engaging conversation. So let's bring a little bit of this into, into the room. Well, we're doing the March of Error. 
margin of error. That's an interesting phrase. And I see you've got delicate Watkins working the crowd. Well, I hope it's not going to be the only one. <laughs> I tell you what, Councilman, I will keep it off mind until I walk into that booth on Tuesday. And if you win, it'll be why standard Moses. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> Moses will do for now. We'll save Jesus for your second time. <laughs> I chose, and there were so many um, scenes that could have been chosen, but I chose this because I feel like um, in many ways it's kind of this subjective religious integration um, into the wire where um, really what happened during the service wasn't as significant as it potentially could have been. Um, we have the gathering where we see everyone um, coming in. You've got the gospel, you've got the song that, that moves us and gets us kind of moving and rocking and shaking. Um, but it, it's, it's really kind of a um, very subjective view of what happens on a Sunday morning in an African-American church. Um, and particularly when we get into the actual message, which is not a message of, you know, salvation. It's not a message of loving your neighbor. It's not a message um, of, of empowering the community. Um, it's not a message of forgiveness, um, which are traditional messages that you might hear on a Sunday morning. But the only message that we get um, in, in this series is a message about... Um, um, encouraging folks to vote on the next on the next day, and so you kind of have this kind of political integration, and that's really the only reason this scene is 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 in the movie. Um, and so we we hear the response of the people; they're responding. Um, but I really like the fact that um, at least in this scene, you see a little bit um, of religious integrity, particularly when the pastor um, says to the councilman. Um, I'm going to have an open mind until I get in, 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 in that box, which is um, a counter narrative to politicians who we've seen paying off ministers and ministers kind of benefiting from kind of being in the know and, and knowing the right people. So um, I, I wanted us to, to look at that because, you know, when I, when I originally saw it, when the, 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 um, the episode opened, I was like, oh, okay, we're really about to get something good here. Um, and, and I'm hearing the singing, I'm seeing the people gathering, I'm expecting. Um, really an opportunity for Simon to engage um, the black church in a different sort of way and then we're just really disappointed to see that it was really all about the councilman attending church um, and the response to that. Um, the second scene that I wanted to, to play, which is this is really one of my favorites, um, but there's a little bit of profanity as we all know, um, so prepare your ears. <laughs> On Sunday morning, you call that? I'm sure I'm to go. On Sunday morning, Y'all try to hit a nigga when he taking his wrinkle ass grandma's to pray? And y'all hit a nigga neither? Oh, y'all kill his grandma's crap? By the time fans ain't go, oh, my damn near the game. Ain't enough y'all to violate this Sunday morning truce. No. I'm standing here already enough to torn up the church building. Y'all ain't got the nerve to try to hit a nigga when he taking his wrinkle ass grandma's to pray? Do you know what a is? Not your mom's for sure. Because if they was that, Y'all would've known better than that bullshit. Y'all trying to what Avon boss their reputation here. You know that? Sure I ain't though. She done cut her face in the glass. And she saw from what I fell in the other than that though. Same time. Huh? I think they got that woman killed, yo. Y'all should have seen me inside our hospital while they stitching her up, lying about why somebody won't shoot me down the street. That woman think I work in the cafeteria. Cafeteria? At the airport, yeah. The airport? Not the airport. Cause I know she gonna never go down and go down and that's why. <laughs> hey yo, keep me this ain't funny, yo. That woman raised me. And for as long as I've been grown once a month, I feel like I'm on a church Sunday. Telling myself, ain't no need to work, cause ain't nobody in this city that go down to disrespect on Sunday morning. Y'all know gonna walk away, man. Right? Y'all know that, right? So we can kind of stop it there. Um, you gotta love Omar, um, who is this kind of gangster, thug, uh, robber, killer, thief, kind of all of the things that you um, kind of can see based on what he has, has done. But even in um, the deepest part of his conscience, there's still something that's sacred about Sunday mornings, right? So um, you got kind of this, this narrative where 
Um, he who violates every law, of the, well, not every law, but many laws that we can even think of, but still um, believes there's something sacred about the Sunday morning. Um, and so then I also saw this kind of dichotomy between the Generation X and the Millennials and their view of Sunday morning. And so you have these older um, gentlemen who are in the game who are saying there's something sacred about this Sunday morning. It should not be touched. It should be respected um, at all costs. But then you have kind of this, these Millennials who um, don't understand the context of the sacredness of the Sunday morning. And so I thought that was really interesting because it's something that we also see even now um, between the Generation X and the Millennials. Um, and and I, I just wanted to bring that, that up because there's something that has been lost um, in the sacredness um, of Sunday, in the sacredness of the church, um, as we see particularly in inner city um, urban areas where um, Sunday morning may not be what it used to be 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago. But I also feel like Simon really missed an opportunity um, to really have some serious religious dialogue by even seeing like what the grandmother's reaction um, to this scene was. Uh, and, and the earlier scene was they were getting in the, um, in the cab to go to church um, when they were attacked and shot at. And so it would have been really great to see what her response was. What is, was it a forgiving response? Um, how, how did she react to exactly what happened? And where did her faith come to play in that? And then also to see the church's reaction. So since she is a faithful church-going member, um, what does it look like for the church to respond to this type of violence that happens to someone who's on their way to church? So I just feel like there were a couple of missed opportunities. Um, but then also the fact that um, you know, Omar, with, with all of the treachery that he does, still, like he said, once a month, make sure he goes to church with his grandmother. And then where the disconnect between him going to church once a month but on Sunday, um, but then on Monday being able to rob somebody or kill somebody. So there's certainly kind of a disconnect there. Um, and then the last scene I wanted to show um, our, our dear friend Bubbles. <laughs> Takes his hat off. Good morning. Completely ignored. Morning, Reverend. by the church on his kind of morning run to, to sell this merchandise so that he can actually cop drugs. Um, but on the way, he sees these women coming out of the church and has actually enough respect to take his hat off, to say good morning, um, certainly to ask for some food. Um, but beyond that, he was completely ignored. They didn't even respond to him. There was not even a good morning. Um, and then when um, the reverend comes out, um, for me, as a pastor, I'm hoping for a different response. I'm hoping he's going to say good morning. I'm hoping he's going to at least ask the brother, you know, how you doing? Um, and again, he just walks by and completely ignores, ignores him. And so this played into the whole notion of dehumanization um, for me um, during this, this, this series. Because we see a lot of that, and we saw a lot of that on the street, and, and how the drug dealers um, kind of dehumanize the drug users, how the policemen kind of dehumanize the drug dealers. Um, but it would have been nice to see a different kind of narrative where at least the church, at least the pastor, at least those who were worshiping coming out of the church had an opportunity um, to recognize the humanity in, in another person. Um, and so I just want to kind of talk about some missed images that, that we could have seen, um, such as recovery programs. We see that in the very, very last season. Um, but the church is, 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 is really involved in recovering programs, whether they're homeless initiatives, um, issues dealing with housing and justice, um, the whole notion of re-entry and, and prison programming that help um, folks to, to succeed once they come out. 
Um, educational advancement. We saw what was happening in, in the school system and how the church plays a role in that, whether it's through after school programs or through scholarships um, for college, which we didn't see that. Um, jobs and living wages um, and how the church um, can help promote those, those kinds of things. I know we just finished working on the fight for 15 um, and we're able to get that passed here in New York and there are a lot of clergy who were actually involved in that. Um, and then just looking at kind of positive police clergy relationships, um, which, which we really didn't see a lot of. We saw a lot of manipulation. Um, we saw um, a lot of kind of one using the other to, to, for advancement, but we really didn't see um, really positive imaging between the police and, and clergy. Um, and so I really just kind of as a, as a practical model um, wanted us to think about the 21st century church model um, as a response to the wire. And what does it look like for us to, to actively engage um, issues around race, issues around um, these, these kind of dirty politics, issues around um, kind of this police brutality um, and the fight um, for police officers to, to do the right thing um, versus the images that we see um, so pervasively on social media and on television. And so um, just thinking about some of the things that we did see that, that I feel like Simon could have pushed a little further was this kind of um, reactivation of activism. Um, and so the fact that um, the pastor was telling folks it's important to go out um, and exercise your right to vote. So reminding um, churchgoers of their social responsibility, um, which is something that happens in a lot of churches, but it's something that we really didn't see much of um, in this, because that social responsibility is not only um, around um, voting in elections, but, but speaking to someone who, who is an invisible to, uh, to other folks. Um, celebrating the sacred um, in the secular so that there doesn't have to be a dichotomy between the secular um, and the sacred, but finding images of God um, in, in both. Um, eliminating ex exclusivity, so, so who's good enough to be spoken to, who's good enough to enter the church versus those, and embracing difference as a divine distinction. And then finally, honoring humanity. Um, it's seeing the humanity in everyone. Um, certainly the person who's in the suit, but also the person who's on the corner, the person who's high, the person who's using, um, the person who really just needs to be um, seen. And so I think that these are many of the things that we do at FCBC, and I can certainly talk about that um, a little bit more if we have time, but these are, the, these are the missed opportunities that I see that really could have made a tremendous impact um, um, on this um, series. And then I just really, I picked this up off the internet and I just thought it was really, really interesting that um, in all of these images, um, I don't know who did it, I, I, I want to give them credit, but whoever put it on the internet, that's where I got it from. Um, but kind of everything from kind of this lawful good, this neutral good, this chaotic good, um, lawful neutral, true neutral, chaotic neutral, and all of these images, the, the lawful evil, the natural, the neutral evil, and then the chaotic evil, which is, you know. Um, but just where, where is faith in all of this? You know, and, and where is the religious integration in all of this? And I think it's a, it's a piece that really could have had tremendous impact that was sorely missed. So, thank you. Well, I think we have about 10 to, about 10 to 15 more minutes for a Q&A. Um, I have questions I can ask, but I see someone coming, so let's just open it right up for conversation. Just please uh, state if it's for the entire panel or for specific panelists. That'd be great, thank you. Um, Sherry Parks from the University of Maryland. Um, and, I, and I guess it's more of a question, I'm not sure that anybody can comment on it. When Omar says, do you know what a colored woman is, that statement, um, in, the, in the context of, of religion, African Americans, as, as Lakeisha pointed out, Reverend Lakeisha, I don't want to get to the um, <laughs> religiosity is both church and the life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, my last book is Fierce Angels, and I trace the sacred dark feminine and the strong white woman and argue that they're the same. And so mother worship is actually not an underestimate. Um, black women are often seen in the black community as, as having a very close relationship to God. And, you know, and in Baltimore, sometimes when, when black women have approached the police for their communities, people like to give them notes to get to the police to, uh, there have been cases of firebombing them, which shocked the community, and then um, in conversations, young black men who have done it said, but that's the most respectful way to kill somebody. I can't mm -hmm. shoot an older black woman, mm -hmm. but I had to. My instructions were to kill her. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, this interesting conversation between the sacred and the feminine mm -hmm. in a church that is religious, that still is, at least in the face of it, very masculine mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to hear you talk about the, the role of gender and sacred practice 
which like, when I say sacred practice, I mean the everyday sacred practice mm -hmm. of, of African Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that um, certainly there's something to be said about the the um, kind of the notion of the praying grandmother, um, right? Which is what, which is how I grew up. I grew up seeing my grandmother pray. I grew up seeing the mothers of the church, um, you know, calling me up to say my skirt was too short or to spit that gum out. And so there was kind of like this this village notion. It, take, it takes a village to raise a child, um, which has very, very strong roots in the African American church. Because when we went to church, um, anyone who asked you to do anything, you were, you were to respond with respect and obedience. And something has been lost along the way um, with that because I see my, our experience, and that's 116th and 7th, um, is that those corner boys that we see um, don't necessarily have the same respect for um, that, that older African American woman who's on her way to church. Um, and so something has been lost, and we're still trying to figure out what that looks like, how we recapture that, um, how we reconnect these generations that are so disconnected now, more disconnected now than probably they, they've ever been. But when we think about those, those kind of gender roles, it's interesting because we didn't see the older African American man um, going to church um, or being involved in um, this kind of religious, um, or the pieces of, of um, religion that we've seen um, in these scenes. So I think it's, it's certainly something that we can, that we need to look at and observe a little bit more and, and try to figure out where the disconnect happened. Um, I don't even know if many churches still even have mothers of the church, but we used to have a mother's, mother's bitch, uh, you know, where they were sinning, and you would go and they would pray for you. Everybody didn't go to the pastor for prayer. They went to the mothers for prayer. And so something has been lost and we've got to figure out a way to kind of recapture that, particularly for practicality and what's happening with our youth right now. There, there are moments though, it seems to me, even in the wire, in quote unquote secular spaces, where it seems to me that um, <clears throat> female characters have this kind of authoritative, right? This authoritative aura. I'm thinking, for instance, when Buddy Colvin gathers all the kids into the school, right? When he's trying to initiate hamster dinner, right? He has, them in the, he has them in the gym, right? And they're, you know, they're yelling, they're screaming, and then the female principal comes in, Right, and they all kind of they they all sit down and be quiet. Yeah, right, that's true. when Mrs. Sampson comes into Prince Belusky's class, right, right, she she gets a certain kind of respect. It seems weird, right. Now, part of the way she she's been there for a while, right. But there seems to be the sheep, right. There's a kind of not only respect but a kind of fear as well, right. A part of that might have something to do with. I mean, I don't know if they're trying to play on the this this stereotypical notion of you know matriarchal right, right black community or something. I'm not sure, right. But something's going on there, right. That I haven't heard too many people right talk. That I haven't heard too many people really, really talk about, like. Those figures are, are, are revered and feared in a certain type of way, right? But they, I mean, it doesn't really—it doesn't really get developed. Now you're talking about the why, and I'm going to talk about first the Renaissance. Okay? okay. And the reason why I'm going to say that, out of my 77 years in that same community, and used to go to first Corinthians movie when they really didn't want us to go in the community. And what you got to understand, I know every church in Harlem, every preacher and their wife and the others. Jesus. And I used to go to see my mother and pass by that church and I said, I hmm, wonder what's going on in here. Then a friend of mine said, Barbara, give them a chance. Come on down to the revival. And I've been coming ever since. I know my community and I know what's in my you will not find it. I'm not saying it because Reverend Lakeisha is here. Because when she get ready to preach you, but well, she will always say before she go to the Word, God, if you find anything that's not right with Reverend Lakeisha, who else going to say that? Our pastor will put you in your place and preach for you, but he is fine. If you want to come and talk to the congregation, you got to sit through our sermons. Y'all understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and if you don't believe me, we have 730, 930, <laughs> and we Now you tell me what pastor in Harlem, I know some of them in Brooklyn too, that don't, don't let you do for 
fundraiser. And you can stay in the church and not pay your tithes. But let me tell you something. That community is going to know because I'm going to make sure before I leave this world, you're going to have two PhDs. A PhD from the streets of Harlem. That's important. And then that, that right there, that Lord helps. The good that they do in that community, feeding hundreds and hundreds of people, where some are likely bringing too much baked macaroni and passing the up in the church, they don't bring no more baked macaroni. <laughs> Feed uh, clothing. Well, how, many, how much clothing do we give out? Almost three or 5,000 clothes, but they be telling me, well, Lord, we can't bring any more clothes because pastors say it might be a fire. Okay, and Reverend Keisha, you said something that's always, since I've been coming and when I passed by, the bar is right next to, I mean, the liquor store is right next to the church. They said, Pastor, don't call the police on them. How many other churches would do that? So what we got to understand is to begin to build those true ministers. So I don't agree with everything they do and say, but what they do is for that community. How many preachers I'm gonna say it again? Now y'all go, oh, I ain't calling no names. But I know some pastors in Harlem would not allow those people sitting out there to the side and drinking. So when you look at the why, go into the communities, the highways and the byways, and really see the truth, the truth for yourself. So come to first Corinthians. <laughs> Let me tell you, they already know. I better not hear them talking about my pastor and his wife. Because I'm known at home. I will read you. There is not enough respect from the older people, the middle-aged people, because you cannot party with your children and drink liquor and smoke with your children when you can bring them to church. God bless. I got to go now, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, 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 to respond. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I'm gonna, if you have a question, I think it's being recorded, so please come to the microphone. I see. No, it's okay. Take, we got one coming here. First, Reverend Walwyn's going to respond. That'll give you time to come around and get behind. You. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to respond to, to Sister Barbara. Um, when we came to FCBC in 2004, um, the liquor store is, is two buildings down on the same block from, from the church. And what we found were um, the corners were filled with um, corner boys. There, were, there was lots of drugs that were being sold and, and lots of alcohol that was being drank. And it was being done in front of the church um, as well as everywhere else. And so one of the things that... Um, my husband, the senior pastor, did was to begin building relationships with the people who were outside of the church. So it wasn't a matter of calling the police, but it was a matter of saying, listen, this isn't okay. If you want to buy liquor, drink it in front of the liquor store, not in front of the church. If, you, if, you're gonna, if this is what you're going to engage in, can we find another place to do it? Um, and what we've seen is that the block is pretty clear. We have a couple of people who generally still are in front of the, the church, but they're watching our cars. They're coming in and saying um, somebody's out there. Um, and so it's about community building, it's about building relationships, not only um, with the folks who are inside of the building, but making sure that we're reaching the community and the folks who may never step inside of the building. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you so very much, both, all, all of you, for your contributions. Yeah, I, too, grew up in Harlem, and I know the movie that you're talking about because that's the sneak in the early days when it was the RKO. I thank uh, Reverend Waldron. The both Reverend Walters for the work that they are doing because I grew up in a church, I grew up in a black Baptist church, I'm still affiliated with one. Uh, and I know some of these churches around in the neighborhood too. What my concern has been is in the community building that Dr. Walters, that Dr. Walters are doing because I see and feel and I understand uh, it's only a clip stuff that they're doing in the wire and they're showing on one side of the church. Uh, the church overall, however, has. Uh, exhibited in too many cases a kind of hands-off, look away kind of thing in relationship to the people in the community. So when Bub says hello and the sisters walk by, I understand that. 
You know, when the Reverend walks by, I understand that because many of the churches, too many of the churches are closed up, you know, six days a week except for rehearsals and a couple of meetings on Saturday, and then they have service on Sunday. Meanwhile, all those people are in the neighborhood and preach every day, 24 hours, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So when neighborhoods have shifted and changed, that's because if there is activity, if there is a, a movement going on in the neighborhood and a relationship to the people as human beings, then we get a little bit more inclusive involvement with the church. And this is something that I appreciate the Warrens are doing and some other churches. Not all of them are totally dismissive, but not enough of them have enough programs, mm -hmm. which is why we are youngsters on the, on the streets. I mean, you know, when Rockefeller eventually became governor, I mean, they started wiping out all after school programs, you know, juvenile justice, they called it then. So at that point, we look forward to a continuing development in those directions as opposed to those directions. I'm glad you all are studying and talking about this kind of thing and using the wire as a, a, a cosmological way of looking at the insanguinity of all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think we have two more questions. So will these? So these will be our last two questions. Okay. Um, I think I have like a comment and a question. So. Um, Reverend Lakeisha, um, I, I was thinking while you were presenting, I thought about what is a church? That was like the question I kept thinking. And maybe for me, I think you were talking about the physical building of, of the church, like the physical space. And I was thinking about these other things, like the community that may not actually be coming to the physical space, but they still have this code. And I think Joseph talked a lot about that in his presentation like elements of spirituality and faith that weren't necessarily directly linked to the church. Because I think in season, th um, the last two seasons, you see a lot of community activists mm -hmm. coming out and they're starting, they're doing things in the schools and they're doing things, they're starting a boxing gym and things like that. So you're seeing these, these things where people are reaching out to the community, but it's not necessarily directly the church doing it. But I still think those people are, are I guess, um, building off of faith and spirituality. And also, I thought about with Joseph's presentation, I thought about the fact that um, everyone has a code. I remember Omar said that in one conversation, he said every man has to have a code. So it's like, even if they're not in church, you have some type of morality mm -hmm. that's guiding them. And I think my question for you, Reverend Keisha, is how, how do you think that type of spirituality is developed outside? Is that how I remember the question? How do you think that spirituality is developed outside of the church, and is that spirituality Thank you. Um, I want to just say a couple of things. I think that one of the notions that we have to just kind of be mindful of is because when someone does something good, it's not necessarily a reflection of their faith or their religion. Some people are just good folks who just do good things. And so some of the community activism that we may have seen may have had no direct connection to the church or religion or faith at all. But I think that um, the other piece to that is there is no really one definition of the church. Um, and because most churches are autonomous, um, you can find any number of things going on in any number of churches. Um, and some things are okay for some churches and some things are not okay for others. So we, we probably will never, and I'll, I'll, I'll use our word rarely, but have one definition of what it means to be church or to be the church. Um, but what I do think is important is um, folks to have a connection to a greater power and to a higher power. And I think the example that we saw of that is even when we think about slavery, right, where we have our um, ancestors who are enslaved people who don't necessarily have a connection to the church or don't necessarily even have a connection to the Bible because it's illegal to read, but for some, somehow, some way, they were able to get a connection to God. And so I think that for many churches now, we hold on so tight to the Bible and we hold on so tight to doctrine um, that we leave very little room for actual direct engagement um, with God. And so I think we've got to kind of go back to some of the things that our foreparents um, were able to do, getting that connection with God, having a better relationship with God than we have with the Bible, having a better relationship or a stronger relationship with God than we have with the church. And so I think for, for me, it's about meeting people where they are spiritually um, and, and engaging them in a place where they can continue to grow ind individually and perhaps even independently from the church. So. Thank you. So maybe we'll take this final question and if each of the panelists want to offer a final word, that would be great. Thank you. 
Um, so I, I just wanted to share uh, an observation about the wire and then get your response about it. Um, so I don't, I don't have much experience with um, religion, but trying to make sense of some of the final scenes of the wire. Um, I got the sense that David Simon thought that for the, the, uh, the, corner, the corner boys and the police, the streets themselves were the church, uh, especially with uh, the scene with, with Marlo, uh, where his army is in prison and he relinquishes all of his riches. And because of those two things, uh, people don't want what he has anymore, and he's not a threat. And by virtue of those two things, the streets redeem him. <coughs> um, and, and the second part of that is uh, religion, my understanding of religion is, is a, a system through which we can all make sense of the world. It allows for good things to happen and for bad things to happen. And the way that these people were portrayed in the wire, so did the streets allow for good things to happen and bad things to happen. Uh, so I just want to put that out there and hear your response. Great final question. Yeah, it's a great, great question. I think so, so there's several important points that you, that you, that you, you made. Right? I think, I definitely think that there's, there's a way in which you can see the corner as a kind of sacred, sacred space to some extent. I mean, depending on the perspective, right? There's also a sense of like, like belonging. Is that like, you know, another term I, I think about is notions of home, right? And belonging, right? So at the end, um, right before Bodhi, Bodhi, Bodhi gets, gets killed. Oh, actually, those who haven't seen it, I'm sorry. But I'm kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's late, 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 late enough. But yeah. Bodhi, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is actually season. Uh, well, yeah, season four towards the end, right? Um, and, you know, who is saying, "Come on, Bodhi"? Like he knows that he knows that Marlon has sent people to get him because they think he's he snitched, right? And um, he says, "No, this is my corner, right? I'm not leaving. Right? I'm not leaving this, right?" So there's a sense of mindness, a sense of possession, right? But I do think that <coughs> to go to, go to your, your, your final your final your final point about right, um, all these spaces having being ambivalent in a certain type of way, right? Producing good and bad, right? One of the things that the wire is doing is setting up certain kind of juxtapositions, right? Um, between certain kind of spheres that we usually see as being incompatible, right? So in the first season, it's law enforcement, right, in the streets, right? Constant juxtaposition, you're seeing that, right, there, there are similar qualities and characteristics in both, right? So potentially, right, what you're, what you're suggesting here, right, is that, um, I think you hear you saying that there might be something sacred about the streets, right? The, the streets, right, the streets in the quote unquote church might have some, right, there might be some overlap there, right? Right, there might be some, and, and actually that is not, um, that is not a new, that is not a new uh, kind of juxtaposition. You read James Baldwin's Fireman's Time, he makes the same comparison, right? He compares the streets to the church and so forth, but, right, but no, I think it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's thank our panelists once again. Thank you all. For